Um, děkuji. Uh, dobrý den. Uh, Thank or, you. Hello. Uh, as you can see already or hear, the similarity between Czech and Ukraine is very, uh, it's very similar. No, it's uh, we can say we have a lot of similarities, and this is also what I want to talk about. Um, maybe see if there are any parallels between what Prague uh, went through in the past 10 years in becoming a more livable city. Uh, and maybe, you know, some of Ukrainian cities can see that maybe they are at the same stage and maybe they can see some uh, uh, examples or uh, they can draw some lessons learned. But before I start, uh, who of you has been uh, to Prague? Raise your hands. Okay, and who of you uh, thinks that Prague and Lviv are similar? Okay, only so few. Who thinks they are not similar? Okay, two people, good. Well, I th I'm sure there are some similarities because there is a famous American movie with Barbara Streisand that was made in Prague, but it's actually about Lviv. So I'm sure that there must be some similarities. Um, Maybe, um, as it was said, I'm an urban planner. I have my consultancy that's on plan, but I was uh, working at the Institute of Planning and Development. I was a deputy director for some time. Um, and this is 10 years ago. Uh, I was before working in South uh, Asia, and I came uh, to Prague, and, uh, and I was a bit uh, astonished uh, about the planning cultures. I think it's very important to you know, talk about planning cultures. Um, because planning is not only about the laws um, that Anna Bundar was talking about, but it's also about you know, our heritage, our, the way how we do things. Um, so it's always this mix of the formal uh, procedures and the informal procedures. And uh, um, sometimes it's good uh, you know, to, to, to classify or to kind of categorize what is this post-communist planning culture, which I think uh, maybe uh, cities in Ukraine also have, uh, because we have some shared past, as it was mentioned also uh, by colleagues from uh, Vilnius. So uh, I will have a lot of pictures, don't worry, but the first slides will be text, so I apologize. Um, so, you know, 10 years ago, I landed in Prague. I'm Czech, but I haven't been living there for a long time. And I was wondering, where am I? How do they plan, actually? You know, you can see we had the tools, but it seems like we were using them in a the wrong way. We had the horse, but we were not using it properly. Um, so the first way how this post-communist planning culture was characterized is that there are no uh, values really, and there is ad hoc decision making. So, you know, you come with a proposal to the planning authority and they say this or this, if you have a lot of money, if you can impress, they usually say, okay, you can do it. Uh, the second characteristics 10 years ago was that there is a gap between what is on the papers at the national policies, let's say in terms of environment protection or public participation. And there is something else that we were actually doing in terms of environment protection or public participation. Very often it was just formal, but no public participation was happening. You know, if you appealed, they would just say, we cannot uh, accept your appeal. We cannot take you seriously. That's it, without any uh, reasoning, without any dialogue. Uh, the third is that planning functions were privatized. Um, because in the 90s, for a lot of architects, it was much more interesting to work in their private uh, companies. So a lot of them left the public sector and uh, you ended up with bureaucrats, uh, not even planning cities, but simply just you know, stamping uh, papers. So uh, there was this lack of creativity, invention. Actually, the planning profession uh, didn't really exist. Uh, the fourth lack of professional planners, which I think is, is connected to uh, the privatization and this kind of exit of creative people from the public service. Uh, uh, then um, a lot of this decisions were motivated by uh, very narrow economic interests. Uh, there is a term urban regime coalitions, which is a very old American uh, description for a kind of group of people, developers, very often architects because they need developers to make money, but also politicians and some media people 
who have common interest and they work, you know, together. So we would say that a lot of planning decisions were uh, driven by these interests. And the last one, uh, low capacity of planning to resolve conflicts and low capacity for citizen participation. So this is very well described in literature and this was the case 10 years ago. And my question is whether it's still valid. So if we are in 2023, whether it's still valid. And I would like uh, to take you on a, a tour through what has happened in Prague in the past 10 years. Um, so exactly 10 years ago, we transformed our planning department from uh, Ustav Rozvoje, which sounds very military, and it was uh, in fact a very military organized department with a lot of technocrats and bureaucrats to a more friendly institute of planning and development, which is more you know, open, uh, has a lot of young people who were uh, educated in Western Europe and came with uh, knowledge and experience. And the director of the institute started organizing these uh, metropolitan debates. They were always on Saturday so that everyone can come. And as you can see, uh, there was a very wide, you know, uh, uh, portfolio of stakeholders. So for instance, okay, I'll just take the, the proper tool. So for instance, this guy is important because he is director of a big developing company. We will see their project at the end. Uh, you have a clergy, you had a lot of kind of radical activists, and they would all sit at a table. It would be very well structured. Every Saturday would be a different topic. And they just talked about, you know, what are the problems and how we can overcome them. I think that was really important to get ourselves at kind of a shared idea of where we are or where we want to be. Um, the second a very important uh, step was to actually uh, approve new building regulations for Prague that introduced a language that everyone understood. They are illustrated. Uh, they talk about things like street lines, um, you know, regulations for uh, light, etc. Um, and they also allowed to build livable cities because the technical norms that are in the rest of the country uh, for instance, would not allow for compact urban blocks because of the demands for lighting. Um, then uh, there was the strategic planning. Um, I can talk for a long time about it. I was also a part of that. Maybe one thing that we realized is that in Prague, we, you know, we cannot compete with Warsaw in terms of you know, being the hub for finance or with Vienna. Uh, but we realized that in Prague, we, are, we have very high proportion of people working in creative industries, um, like gaming, you know, video games, or um, animation, CGI, and film, and obviously marketing. And uh, we created an office that's called Creative Prague that supports these industries. It's about 18% of employment with very high uh, uh, earning wages. And I think we can relate to the presentation. That there was uh, yesterday from Creative Europe, where I think it's really important high earners. And they, you can also change the way how you regard culture, because culture is the breeding ground for creative industries. And creative industries create content for all the mobile phones and tablets that you have in your pockets. So that was really important to understand, you know, how Prague wants to make money. And uh, yeah, then I was actually also in charge of public participation. So before 2013, there was practically no public participation. Uh, we prepared a manual that uh, for each planning process. So if you have the zoning plan or if you want to, you know, regenerate a neighborhood, a housing estate that we talked about is, you know, socialist housing estates. So how you should involve people in different projects or different processes. It's in Czech, but you can download it. It could be maybe translated. I think it's quite interesting. Uh, what Prague is good at, at an international level is open data. Uh, we have data on really everything and they are open. So you can download them and use them in GIS. Uh, and you can just analyze and work with them in your project. Uh, <clears throat> we actually won a, a, comp uh, a prize uh, globally. Then we prepared a new spatial plan, and 
it's a great idea, but maybe you remember Cass Christian said talking about this one ship and a flotilla of ships or an armada of ships. Unfortunately, this was done more of a one ship of one master planner. And uh, as a result, it never really gained approval, kind of wider approval. So it's still not uh, approved, even if it's been in process for 10 years. So not everything was always successful. A very good tool uh, is a public space design manual, uh, which is, again, made specifically for Prague. I believe some of it is also translated to English. And again, it gave a tool to the city to basically approach or developers or um, architects or um, transport engineers that design public spaces to basically have the common language and to have the common, uh, let's say, regulations or intentions. So even in architectural competitions or whenever uh, uh, the planners discuss with investor, they just show this. They say you have to comply with this and it's done. Obviously, they run a lot of trainings uh, so that uh, uh, experts are trained how to use the manual. Um, there is uh, a, a consensus that we should build only on brownfields. And if you see uh, these red spaces, so this is Prague, this is the river, uh, here is the downtown. And all these dark red spaces are brownfields, so formal industrial areas um, that we can build. Uh, the pink is where we already built, and the white is where we know that we will not build. That's the green areas. Uh, so you can see we have a lot of green um, areas. Uh, and there is a consensus that we built only on brownfields because we have so many of them. Um, so it's almost impossible to get a planning uh, permission to uh, to build on a green area or uh, unbuilt. And uh, um, I will just zoom into one project that I worked uh, with my private company, and that's in downtown of Prague, uh, a very small brownfield. Uh, I can maybe show you where it is. It's actually right here. It's a rail yard uh, that actually was created with the first railway station in Prague. 1848, uh, they demolished uh, the wall, uh, you know, the, uh, the fortification, a train came in, obviously from Vienna, uh, where, from where else, and, uh, and since then, uh, this was used for railway, but now it's, uh, it has no use anymore. If you come by bus uh, to Prague, as a lot of Ukrainians come, they come to this place, it's called Florence. There are two private owners, and uh, the city gave them a condition that if they want to develop this area, they need to have an international urban design competition. Uh, <clears throat> so competitions are you know, another tool that uh, we use a lot. Um, it's, it was a very complicated site because you have, as you can see, uh, multitudes of uh, transport infrastructure. Um, but what I can say, and I think what is really important uh, to do, even in a, I would say, war scenario or post-war scenario, is uh, to involve all the stakeholders that you know, have a say or can have a say. And we, we do it at a very high level. So for instance, uh, this lady here is the head of heritage protection for the entire country. Uh, you know, this is the owner of the developing company. And we really discuss all the topics. So for instance, in this case, we had, I think, five discussions, you know, once for heritage, once for uh, uh, rail uh, networks, um, um, et cetera. So uh, did you kind of uh, make sure that all the stakeholders approve the brief for the competition? Um, um, we talked about public participation. This was happening during COVID time. Uh, we really like to use a tool called Mapsionaire. It's a Finnish, uh, I think it's a Finnish uh, um, invention. It's an online uh, kind of map-based uh, questionnaire uh, where instead of answering questions, which you can as well, but you can directly mark uh, into a map. You can change, uh, you know, the, uh, the map. Uh, appearance can be a photo, can be a map. Um, so, we work with this and um, maybe also for a kind of a war or a conflict scenario that you can do public participation online. Uh, we usually have what we call a consultation group that we invite, you know, people that are active in, uh, in the city life or in, uh, 
critiquing the development. So environmental uh, NGOs, heritage NGOs, uh, or just people who are very critical in terms of architecture. And, in, and here we were, you know, explaining them the brief, the objectives of the project, and you know you can see me quite frustrated sometimes but if it's well uh, structured it doesn't have to be a pain uh, for the competition it's very important to have models you know 3d uh, physical models uh, that you can have a good discussion as well um, so uh, in this case we had uh, five teams in the competition uh, then three in the second round and this was the the winning uh, design as you can see it's a it's an urban design competition so we have some nice images of uh, the buildings but they are not so important what is important is uh, that you know the private owners together with the heritage protection people with the municipality with the planners agreed uh, on a very low uh, height uh, and a very kind of porous uh, you know um, structure or system of public spaces that are connecting the neighborhoods neighborhoods that were actually uh, separated uh, by barriers of uh, the railway infrastructure and, and the road infrastructure. Um, um, this is in uh, axonometry and uh, um, this is the most important. Uh, that's the result, you know, the result is uh, a drawing with regulation which is then a basis for the agreement uh, between the private investors and the city. So they sign a contract and uh, you see that it's, it shows the public spaces very clearly. It shows the height, it shows what's happening in the courtyards, uh, but then the architecture of the individual building is the next step and uh, uh, there will be further competitions. Uh, these are some of the principles that explain, for instance, the uses uh, to create a, um, um, livable environment, you know, with retail spaces, with social control, etc. Uh, maybe uh, to conclude, uh, an, a project that is already built uh, as a result of this 10 years of reforms and 10 years of uh, opening uh, the way how we discuss planning, how we discuss Prague, the democratization of planning. Uh, so from the center, we'll move here to what we call Smichov. Uh, there was also a very old railway yard. And uh, based on this 10 years of, of planning, uh, there is a big development that really required a lot of agreements with the public sector because you needed to move the railway, you have to move the bus terminal, you have to invest, uh, the, public has, the public sector has to invest a lot, but the private sector is investing as well. This is a photo from uh, Tuesday. I just was, uh, uh, passed by and you can see maybe something that you would say, well, there's nothing extraordinary about it, but it would be very difficult to build this uh, 10 years ago because of regulations that we had that would not make it possible to build in this way. Uh, but also maybe there wouldn't be this will to build it at this uh, uh, you know, very human scale uh, and to have this agreement between the private and the public sector. So uh, maybe some useful tool we designed or written with Kes Christiansen, who you saw yesterday, uh, a kind of guidebook uh, for, uh, oops, okay. So this doesn't work really, uh, but uh, you can download. Uh, it's 12 principles of building sustainable neighborhoods uh, in uh, 21st century, we call it. Uh, and to the end, so um, do we still have 10 years after uh, we started reform of planning in Prague? Do we still have value-free attitudes? I would say not. We have very clear values uh, in terms of mobility. We have very clear hierarchy, you know, pedestrians first, public transport second, cyclists, and the cars at the end. Um, we know, you know which industries we want to develop. We know we don't want to build on uh, uh, green fields. So we don't have value-free attitudes and we don't do ad hoc decisions anymore. Uh, is there a discrepancy between higher level and, lo and local level? I don't think so. It's, uh, it's not only the documents, but it's especially the workshops and uh, the trainings and the discussion that makes sure that even the, 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 every, the people who work with investors every day, that they know, you know how things should be. 
Uh, planning functions uh, privatized? To some extent, yes. In Prague, we do the plans ourselves, but in smaller towns, sometimes uh, they still use uh, private offices, which is not always bad. Uh, uh, lack professional of planners. I would say less. Uh, there is a big demand or, or, or big interest in actually becoming an urban planner. It's very trendy, and we have this uh, amazing center for uh, planning and architecture where you, know, you can get a coffee and, and, and put, you, put your photo on Instagram and say, I'm a planner. Uh, planning service, services, economic interest. I said no, but I put a question mark because I think we should never be sure that there is no some corruption behind. And low capacity of planning to resolve conflicts. I would say that this has majorly improved. So I think that from this situation, uh, we are more uh, back to uh, the right situation where we know how to use the tools. Thank you very much. Петр, величезне вам спасибі за цю, так би мовити, десятирічний експорт від принципів ситуації, яка населених пунктів Ми посібні, I have a great desire to, to share some of the you mentioned the manual for Prague and the public space design manual and maybe this map based tool. We have enough time just for one question. We are on a very strict schedule. Looking for a raised hand. Here you go. Hello. I have the following question. It's about legislation. You said that 2013, you implemented and you made some amendments in your law, but uh, those pertained to national legislation, but some of the reforms at local level, did they take place in parallel or follow the changes in the national legislation? So the, the changes in the national legislation are continuous. I think you will have to always do changes at the national level. Um, and um, uh, yeah, and I think you should understand, and it was also said yesterday by Kes Christiansen, that you have to go in parallel. You cannot wait uh, for the changes at the national level. You have to try as much as you can do at the local level. Yeah? As, as I said, in Prague, we are quite lucky that we have our, all, uh, our own building regulations, that we can regulate a lot of things ourselves. So we are very flexible in this. Um, but at the same time, I think you can achieve a lot by, um, you know, manuals and workshops and awareness. And, um, and if you have private investors, uh, you, you know, you have the tools to kind of bind them to certain standards. Yeah? And I have to say that um, when you have, you know, three, four developers who actually apply these standards, then the others, they don't want to be behind. So they will catch up and do the same. Yeah? There's a lot of things that you can do uh, without the legally binding uh, requirements. And maybe one thing that's really interesting that I didn't mention is the contributions. So we have a system where when you want to build, you have to pay from each meter square uh, to the city. It's specifically calculated and um, but you can also deduct, for instance, uh, for the competition, uh, uh, you can, uh, you are, the, the city obliges you to organize a competition, but the costs that you have as an investor, you can deduct from the contribution to the city. So at the end, it's for free yeah, for you. So that's, a, that's one of motivation. We have uh, other cities in the Czech Republic where they motivate investors to have ground floors for retail because a lot of uh, developers don't want to put retail on the ground floors. And, uh, they can lower their contribution if they provide retail on the ground floor. So that's another tool uh, where you can, you know, without laws, you can basically motivate. 